Did you know that at the start of the Phanerozoic Eon, 542 million years ago, the Earth's surface was bare? It had been bare for 4.1 billion years. I mean, the Earth is only 4.6 billion years old. But the Earth's surface would have looked similar to this. This, of course, is canyon lands in Utah. Uh, ignore the green river flowing through it. There weren't any plants at the beginning of the Phanerozoic Eon. But it looked something like this for a long time. But that is about to change. As we continue on our series of lectures, and this one is going to be the Phanerozoic Eon, the first part of it, known as the Paleozoic. Actually, it's about half of it. Now, Phanerozoic means visible life. And we're still in the Phanerozoic Eon. And it's during the Phanerozoic that life just rapidly diversifies, or at least multicellular life rapidly diversifies. And the Phanerozoic Eon actually began with something called the Cambrian Explosion. Doesn't that just like sound exciting to you? The Cambrian Explosion? Aren't you just ready to know what that is? Basically, throughout this Phanerozoic Eon, the continents have drifted around, and life went from very primitive multicellular animals to what we see today. Now, of course, it was all set up by events in the Proterozoic and in the Archean, from DNA replication, the evolution of photosynthesis, followed by aerobic respiration and symbiosis, and then secondary endosymbiosis that was going to go on to form plants. So, why? Why did life really take like 4.1 billion years to kind of take off. So I'm going to discuss some of the theories about why life rapidly diversified in the Cambrian over 500 million years ago. And hey, we're going to talk about animals. I'm going to give you some defining characters of animals. And, you know, during this time, animals began to move on land. Plants moved on land. What were those challenges? And when did they do that? And then um, there's also to move on to land and to get to the life we see today, there have been key evolutionary innovations, much like what we saw in the previous 4 billion years. And then something else happens, mass extinctions. And of course, I'm going to talk about the importance of mass extinction to diversity. I know, doesn't that seem wrong? But if you look at it, this is a chart of diversity starting at 542 million years ago to today. And there are two trends here. One is, it's generally going up, especially in the last 6,500 million years. And why so much in the last 100 million years? Hmm, sounds like a key evolutionary innovation to me. And then you also notice these dips. And those dips are mass extinctions. Not only are they important for diversity today, but the causes of those mass extinctions and the consequences of them can help inform us about what we're doing to our planet today. Yes, we're in the sixth mass extinction now. So, how did the Earth go from barren landscape looking... I mean, I don't want to call canyon lands barren. There are plants and trees and animals there. But you get the idea. So how do we go from barren lands to a world teeming with life? How did that happen? Well, we're going to focus on the Paleozoic today. And the time periods of the Paleozoic include the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian, the Carboniferous, and the Permian. Now, the point is you don't need to go and memorize all these periods and their dates, but I do feel that it's important to familiarize yourself with those terms. So if somebody goes, hey, the Ordovician, you might not know the exact dates, but you might remember, oh yeah, that was early in the Paleozoic, so it was hundreds of millions of years ago. So this is the Paleozoic. This is what the Earth looked like. This was over 300 million years ago. Lots of shallow seas, the Earth would be unrecognizable. But at the start of the Paleozoic, this time period called the Cambrian, this is when animals rapidly diversified. So the question I like to ask is, you know, what... What is an animal? So every lineage of living organisms has what they call defining characters. And these characters are what separate them and make them unique 
from other living organisms. So an animal, all right, here it goes, is a multicellular heterotroph that feeds by ingestion. Okay, there's a lot there. Multicellular, that means we're made up of more than one cell. We are, you and I are made up of about 17 trillion cells, actually. So animals are made up of cells, okay? Heterotrophs, troph means feeding, hetero means other. That means we acquire our nutrients from the environment. Yes, there are some photosynthetic animals, but we acquire our nutrients from basically eating other things. We have a mouth. We ingest things through our mouth and we have a digestive tract to digest and break down all the organic molecules and absorb them. Animals are mostly tubes, except for the ones with radial symmetry. And that brings me to my next point. Animals have symmetry. There's a body plan involved. The radial symmetry, think of like a disc, a circle, cut it in half, both halves are the same. And that includes the cnidarians, you know, jellyfish, corals, things like that. You and I, and birds and snakes and reptiles and arthropods and worms, we have what is called bilateral symmetry. We have a right and a left. We have a top and a bottom, a front and a back. And the vast majority of animals have bilateral symmetry. Now that also means another thing, that we have true germ layers, an endoderm, a mesoderm, and an ectoderm. Now some animals like cnidarians only have the ectoderm and the endoderm, which is your outer layer, ecto, which means out, and the inner layer, which is your endoderm. And then the rest of us have these three layers. So this forms my ectoderm, my mouth and my digestive system, you know, stomach and colon and, and intestines. That's all of my endoderm. And then things like muscles and some of your nervous system is the middle part, which is your mesoderms. And then lastly, animals have the ability to move by contracting muscles coordinated by a nervous system. Nothing else on the planet has that. So that's how I define animals. That's how most people define animals. But then for some reason, most taxonomy classes and taxonomists include sponges, even though they lack germ layers, they lack symmetry, they lack germ layers, and uh, they don't have a, a muscle system coordinated by a nervous system. So I don't consider sponges to be animals. Okay, so animals, it's like there were none. Then all of a sudden, they rapidly diversified and they were everywhere. And, and we actually defined the start of the Cambrian, I believe, by the arrival of a arthropod called a trilobite. And uh, so what happened? How did this happen so rapidly? I mean, it happened over tens of millions of years, but still, the Earth was around, you know, life had been around for three billion years before it finally decided to take off into multicellular life. So what happened? Okay, well, there are several theories that have been proposed to explain this rapid diversification of animals during the Cambrian. In fact, it's so rapid, we call it the Cambrian explosion because life exploded onto the scene. So one of them is the rise of predators, which kicked off an evolutionary arms race. So I evolve eyes. I can see you. I evolve ways to evade you. Muscles, fins, you know, move. Okay, I'm going to evolve armor so you can't bite me. Well, I'm going to go evolve teeth and jaws and, and claws to grab a hold of you. So as you can see, you know, there's this evolutionary arms race between predators and prey, and we think that may have driven diversity. Now, I've been saying that for about a decade. Turns out there might be other factors involved as well, and one of them instead of just an evolutionary arms race, could be symbiosis. These things are working together where cooperation is important, where there's more mutually beneficial arrangements going on, not just competition. Here's another key innovation as well. Animals have Hox genes. We could actually call that another defining character of animals, but Hox genes are developmental and regulatory genes. They're like a master control set of genes 
And what they do is they control the body plan of animals. Now, here's the thing. You know, a lot of people have criticized evolution and said, there's no way, even with the vast amount of time, that animals could evolve to be so complex and so diverse in the time we've had. And the answer to that, of course they can. They did. We know they did. But one of the answers to that are the Hox genes. Because small mutations in these Hox genes can lead to rapid evolution in the body plan. So you can go from an insect to a, crust to a crustacean pretty easily just by making small changes to these Hox genes. Also, right before the Cambrian, remember we got the ancestors to plants. We no longer have mats of cyanobacteria. We're actually having more photosynthesis. We're getting more oxygen in the atmosphere. So animals need oxygen. So oxygen is energizing life, right? Giving it the energy it needs so it can grow to be larger, more complex, and be able to move around and actually chase prey or escape predation. And something that I've added in recently, the evolution of the ancestors to plants. You know, I keep saying how important this is. We know they're adding oxygen to the atmosphere, but as they grow and they're creating structure, they're adding more nutrients, more energy, and that structure is important because now we're creating more spaces for animals to live, hide, reproduce, whatever they want to do, right? We're adding ecological complexity to our ecosystems, and this also creates additional routes for diversity to evolve. And if you think about it, think about this. Where are some of the most diverse places on the planet? They're in forest and on coral reefs, and they have lots of things in common. They're not just tropical, but they also have structure for all the different types of organisms to find a place to live. So there we go. So... Uh, the Cambrian explosion has a pretty interesting history. You know, we've known about it for a while, but around the early 1900s, we discovered a fossil bed in, in uh, Canada called the Burgess Shale. And this Burgess Shale was discovered by accident, and it has all of these soft bodied organisms that were preserved and then really well preserved. And the thing about the Cambrian explosion, some people believe that it was an example of what's called punctuated equilibrium, rapid diversification. Life just evolved into all these different types and body plans, like this thing, hallucinogenia. I'm not sure we know what that is yet, although I think I missed, I think there was a paper that came out kind of identifying what that was, but it got the name hallucinogenia because originally we had no modern phyla to put it in. So, pretty cool. Now, during this Cambrian, there were lots of different phyla. Life was experimenting. But out of the Cambrian, we got all of our modern major groups of animals. Things like chordates, which is us, the vertebrates, you know, fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals. The mollusks, which are snails and octopus. Arthropods, you know, insects, crustaceans, arachnids, millipedes, centipedes. The cnidaria, which are your jellyfish and sea anemones. And corals, annelids, which are worms, and nematodes, which are also worms. So by that time, we have the, the ancestors to all of these modern groups. And interestingly, the Cambrian and then the next time period were dominated by invertebrates. These are animals without backbones. So here's an example of some of our modern phyla, arthropods, cnidarians, echinoderms, annelids, mollusks, and of course, the chordates. Now, one of our early ancestors are these urochordates. You know, it's hard to believe that's a relative to us. But you know, the larvae move around. They have a dorsal nerve cord. Where's your, where's your nerve cord? It's on your back. It's dorsal. They have a postanal tail and pharyngeal slits that they use for filtering, just like modern chordates. No, well, we don't use ours for filtering. Well, the Cambrian ended about 485 million years ago, and we began the Ordovician 